Tonight on the Big Footy Podcast, we talk the West Coast Eagles and Fremantle in our WA special. We talk Jack Watts and his future, and Messenger will probably kill me when he finds out there's a Frio theme song in here somewhere. All this and more, coming right up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the sixth episode of the Big Footy Podcast. I am, of course, the Wookiee. I'm your host for this evening. With me are my regular compatriots, the Old Dark Navies. No, apparently he's not there. Messenger. Hello? No, there he is. Messenger. Hello. Uh, and joining us as uh, guests this week for our special WA special, as it were, the Seppo. Hello, all the way from Melbourne. And Pants Kyle. Hey, nonny, nonny. And, and uh, filling in for Chief this week, the Prosecutor. G'day, all. And joining us once more is Jamie Johnston. Evening, all. It's good to see a good cross-section this week for those complaining about the Carlton hegemony earlier on, Messenger. And uh, <laughs> we've got a, a good selection of teams represented here. Prosecutors from the Bombers. Seppo's a Fremantle person. And uh, Pants Kyle is, of course, from West Coast. Um, and uh, Jamie is north. Yeah, we don't need to mention that. Keep but, uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, I, we'll start, as we do every week, with uh, your highlights uh, from the weekend, your standout moments, your highlights, your lowlights, as it were. Um, and we'll start with Jamie Johnston. Um, I'd like to say none, but... Carlton getting rolled. It uh, pains me to say that Essendon doing anything good is something I can enjoy, but just seeing you guys get run over at the end like that, it really, I really did enjoy it. So yeah, that F- fan- fantastic. Uh, Pants goal, your highlight from the weekend. Uh, I would say probably the Paul Coast Suns uh, beautiful victory over the North Melbourne Kangaroos. It's ironic because that's my highlight as well. Uh, Seppo, your highlight from the weekend, mate. Uh, Thunder stolen right there. But mine was going to be um, Gold Coast and their improving <laughs> ways with Gary Ablett just performing like he is. It's a spectacle to watch, and I enjoyed tuning into that game as a neutral and just watching North collapse after their great first quarter start. You're not a neutral. You support a franchise team like them. Well, anyway. Messenger, your highlight from the weekend. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to take a different path. I, I watched uh, Sydney take the long handle to the Adelaide Crows on Saturday. They were very, very impressive. Uh, unfortunately, it's made watching Swan the Couch that much harder. I'm afraid Jared and Paul are going to, uh, Ruzi are going to forget themselves uh, on public <laughs> television pretty soon and uh, and uh, yeah, get carried away. But anyway. ODN, you got a highlight? Yeah, I'll complete the flush and say the Gold Coast Suns. Um, honestly, who saw this coming at the start of the year? Five wins at the halfway point, and now I think they could genuinely beat anybody outside of the top four on their day. Yep. They've got a good uh, run home as well. They have. Uh, they, mm. No, I, I'm, I'm not nearly as bullish about the Suns as most, but yeah, I, I think they get decent team. They're going to, they're going to get beaten. We'll, 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 we'll see. I guess, and I, I guess no one else has any highlights, so uh, uh, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the prosecutor uh, is here and he has a um, very oh, he's got many highlights from this weekend oh, has, he um, now? has he now did the prosecutor just refer to himself in the third in person yes the prosecutor did just refer to himself in the third I, person I, I will allow the prosecutor <laughs> the floor to continue don't touch Jimmy um, anyway f- from the Essendon perspective I think um, obviously the win on the Friday night but um, I guess in a more um, specified sense uh Debutants, really. They were my highlights of the week and then this season, really. Yep. Like, obviously, Essendon had Joe Danaher, but even other teams like Sydney with Tom Mitchell, North Melbourne with Magic Door, and Melbourne with Jack Viney. It's just oh, the air of anticipation when you go into the match to see a debutant just adds to the contest and it's fantastic to see. There's a lot of hype that goes into some of those uh, debutants. Joe Danaher had a huge amount of hype built around him. But uh, Tom Mitchell did really well in his first, in, well, I think it's his first game. But um, and I'm spewing that uh, his dad didn't play more games for Carlton. But uh, anyway, so 
<laughs> How many did his old man rack up for the Blues out of interest? I think it was like 21 games or something. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. More did, than Mickey McGowan, though. Did, did, well, <laughs> just as I um, point out the uh, fact that Joe Danaher could have actually played for Sydney under the father-son rule too. I think lucky for everyone that he chose Essendon in the end. How did yep. the AFL not send him there? <laughs> oh, I, for some reason, they gave him the choice. Oversight. <laughs> GWS couldn't pick him up as a zone selection? Um, GWS could have. Um, however, they uh, elected, um, Joe Danaher elected to go the father-son route. But he could have, um, GWS were eligible to pick him up as an under 17 year old or whatever that yeah. um, that under 17 trial thing is that they got Dylan Shield and Tom Bug and all that stuff under. I don't well, I don't think they'll be missing him that much with the way Jeremy Cameron's playing though. Well, I don't Crosser, think so. Essendon could have actually got him as a New South Wales scholarship selection, not, not used a draft pick at all. Could they have? I didn't they know he could have done that. Well, that's, that's how. Wales. Well, that's how um, Hawthorne got. Uh, wasn't he based in? Isn't he based in Sydney? I thought wasn't he was he in... based in Sydney. Hungary, uh, a family seat of Danaher's. It's like something from Game of Thrones. They're all up there living in mud huts, <laughs> reading with each other, pumping out father sons. Does that explain the recessive chin then? Oh, it does. They're not pretty people. Actually, they that... pay the iron price. That's a oh, well. Whatever they're doing, they can keep it up. That's for oh, sure. Oh yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that raises an interesting point. Actually, um, I was watching footy flashbacks on Sunday afternoon, which was the New South Wales v Victoria State game from a couple of years ago, where all the Danahers, except for Joel, obviously, but all the senior Danahers played in the same game for New South Wales, and New South Wales won. Go figure. Was, was that the one where Carey and Longmire did well? Yep. And they, they, yeah, oh, that was a cracking game. Yep. Yeah. One of the few times they let New South Wales line up at full strength. Wearing the the, the powder blue jersey, yeah. I believe. I thought it was white when I it's saw the game. Dark egg blue. <laughs> but uh, anyway, moving along. And uh, um, we, we're lucky tonight in that we've got uh, some people from uh, West Coast here. Uh, in, in in Pants Kyle and we've got uh, some Frio people so we're really going to dedicate this uh, particular podcast to the West Australian viewpoint of the AFL this week and uh, so first up we're going to talk about West Coast and uh, Pants Hall, perhaps yep. perhaps they could be having a better season than they have been. Well, I think that's a bit of an understatement, to be honest. Um, I think we all fell a little bit for the hype at the start of the season and um, the last two seasons, and they've been a very, very, very big disappointment. And just opening it up to anybody else who wants to ask. Well, I, I think the thing we touched on this last week, that... The home record of West Coast and the Crows, for that matter, is is abysmal. I mean, the House of Pain is more like the cubby house of mild discomfort now. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was actually now I thought. Well, anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> don't try and don't try and lump we into this. You did that all by yourself. I right? did all this all by myself. Anyway, so the home yeah. record has been quite poor, and it obviously makes your road games that much harder what's the what's the the feeling amongst the west coast supporters in in uh in perth right now or is it more just a matter of blaming the umpires perhaps um well not really um we get a pretty good run with the umpires as we all know do you um, really play uh, top of the charts with that report <laughs> all right <laughs> let's move along <laughs> no, I think the first few rounds we were pretty disappointed. Uh, you know, we probably more down a little bit um, after the victory against the Kangaroos after the siren. Um, it sort of gave a little bit of uh, excitement to to the club again. Uh, but then that performance against Richmond, which was probably the worst performance I've seen since probably we won the Wooden Spoon. Um, that was just a team that was tired, slow, out of ideas. And I think the worst thing about it was that John Worsfeld really has no answers for what is actually going on. It was funny to watch the, um, I can't remember if it was a Richmond game or another one, just watching his post-match press conference. It was just hilarious. He just had no answers for it. It almost seemed like that on 
game day. He just wasn't making the coaching moves or shifting things around like other coaches have against West Coast. He just looks flat and almost like a terrible game day coach at the moment. He, he doesn't give out any emotion and it's it's great for a press conference and when you're under pressure, but when your fans are just baffled about what's going on, you probably want him to turn around and show a little bit of emotion, show a little bit of anger, start, you know, pulling out his hair. Um, but we don't get that. Getting a bit Brad Scott, getting a bit yeah. visible with the emotion. That's what the West Coast fans would like to see, a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit of emoting in the box. Um, I agree. I agree. I mean, we like to have a little bit of a laugh at Brad Scott uh, on, on the old West Coast from a board. distance. Um, have a from laugh a, from a distance. <laughs> from a distance, from a long way, a long way away. But, um, that's, I wouldn't like you know, to push her up close either, don't worry. Look, he's look, Brad Scott's passion inside the box is, you know, second to almost nobody. So it's um, you'd like to see it for you, from your own coach. You really would. Yeah. Well, you uh, do you think that um, Worst Fall will be there next year, though? Does he still have uh, the passion I, to keep going? I don't think so. Um, but then you have to have a look at who could possibly come in and do a better job. The last thing I want is someone like Scott Burns, who I think – well, being in charge of our midfield group, who is probably, as, you know, there's no A-grade player there. There's not a legitimate excitement machine, and that's his job to get those boys firing. And uh, What about Luke Shuey? Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Luke Shuey's been very impressive. He seems to take up the mantle of the, uh, well, the primary midfielder now, that Kerr's starting to not be as consistent as he once was. Um, do you not see him as an exciting A-grade talent or where do you view him in the picture? I think he could become A-grade, but I think you probably want an X-factor. Um, you know, someone that will break the lines and will, you know, take on the play and not, you know, drop so easily. And I don't think we've got that. Do you have a free agent in mind that could, like, perhaps be put into the West Coast side to make give them that uh, extra step? Well, uh, with Jetta just re-signing with the Swans, that was a, uh, a little bit of a surprise because there was a little bit of word saying that he was a little bit homesick. Um, I think Daniel Rich is out of contract at the end of the season. Um, he's not a break, break the lines type of guy, though, is he? But he's... An, he's His would, kicking does that for him. You know, he probably can be an A grader. Hmm. Mm. What you, about Coniglio? Would... How much would you give for Coniglio from GWS? He's a good good WA boy. He's got 10 years ahead of him. He breaks lines. He does everything. What would you give up to get Coniglio over there? I'd probably prefer O'Meara. Uh, oh, yeah. What are we all? What are we all? As well. yeah. <laughs> the two of them dancing suggestively. <laughs> you, were, you were top five last year um, with, with a significant amount of injuries. Um and you've fallen away dramatically. Do you you would you you could be forgiven for thinking you were going to do a lot better once you had uh, players back on the park. Do you see last year or the year before as where you truly should be now, or do you see reason why uh, why you've fallen away? And is this this year's form where you think you're currently at? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think we definitely should have improved. I mean, what did we finish last year? I think it was fifth on the table. Um, we probably expected a top four finish last season, um, you know, top three thereabouts. But, yes, injuries did affect us a little bit. I think they've affected us a little bit again this season. I don't think we've been able to put on a full-strength team. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I would have fully expected to be top four at this stage, especially with our draw that we had. But do you, do you, so, do you, have you fallen... Have you fallen away significantly in, in areas that you can see where you're now wonder, you're now truly wondering where where your difference is? Um, look, I think the midfield definitely has fallen away. Um, slower, doesn't look like they've advanced too much. Besides maybe Shaw himself, Gaff has really been disappointing. Um, very, you know, very one pace, isn't it? What's that? It's very your midfield seems very one paced. It is very much one paced, and that's that's why we definitely would need that A grade quality or the X factor player that is desperate to go for and desperately need. And uh, you know, there's talk that maybe Dale Garlett will be uh, 
our first pick? Has he reformed enough to justify a position on an AFL list? Oh. It's sort of um, an indictment on that midfield group when you've got Nat Nui as almost your best clearance midfield player as cock in the ruck or Cox, sorry, in the rucks. Is um yeah, it just shows how bad that midfield group is at the moment. You're just waiting for um a bit of X factor to come in there. Is is Wellingham gonna get much of a role when he's he's back in that midfield? Oh, definitely, hundred percent. I'd, I'd say he'll probably come straight back in as well. It's seriously missed it. He's um, first game that he played. I thought he was really impressive. I suppose that's that little bit of X factor you're missing that you're going to get back in there. <laughs> I don't think I don't think he's a bit. Of, he's an X factor player, but I think he's a class player. And you know, we're playing alongside uh, Swan and Pendlebury uh, down at Collingwood. It's you know, how can you not have that bit of class about you yourself? So how do you, how do you fix how, how do you think you fix the problems to uh, ensure a better second half of the season? I don't know if we can at this stage. I, I I think when your when your coach seems out of ideas, then the players aren't learning anything new. Um, look, we've got a terrible draw coming after the bye, and uh, in reality, we need to win all of them. And uh, on form, we'll win none of them. So is, is is there any positives coming forward for you? Because, I mean, even when we talk to the Melbourne people, they could find something positive about their year. They couldn't find much, but they could find something positive. Is there anything positive about your year coming up that you could say, OK, I can hang my hat on this, being the, the light at the end of the tunnel, as it were? Well, they might be playing okay. their big final in round 16 against Freo. That's going to be their holiday of the year, maybe. <laughs> They are eighth at the moment. I mean, they're not completely out of the picture. Well, I think I think the fact the fact that we know we can play and when we're at our best that we can match it with those teams at the top of the table, that's a positive. And, you know, if we come out and beat uh, the Hawks, and then we uh, beat Essendon, suddenly it's game on, and West Coast are looking the goods again. Um, but we lose that game against the Hawks, and it's um, you know head-scratching time again as to what's going on. I, I just want them to, to compete a little bit more, um, not drop away the way they do. Third quarter's a big problem, always has been, but it's just running out the game. And look, I think the Hawks, uh, you know, they they last few weeks, you know, what was it, Albin, GWS and Gold Coast all in a row. Um, I think they're definitely doable. Uh, Pants, I just want to ask you about the uh, leadership stocks at the West Coast Eagles. Darren Glass now is the uh, wrong side of 30. Uh, so yeah. which uh, which leaders are coming up to replace the likes of um, Glass and Cox and Kerr when they move on eventually? I think you'd look at Scooter Selwood or um, Bo Waters would be... I mean, Bo Waters being the vice captain, is he, a lot of people wanted him to become captain this season. Uh, but Glass, you know, when you take out the honours of the All-Australian captain, you don't really give up your club captaincy and he's still playing, um, you know, as good as he was playing last year and the year before. Um, but Scooter Selwood would be one, even though he seems to have dropped off a little bit, um, even though he's still getting pretty good numbers in the, in the game. He's um, probably, you know, the efficiency is probably down. Um, but I don't know, do you, you know, Josh Kennedy... Probably leadership material as well. I'm still very young. Yep. Oh, I've got now. With a, you've painted a picture of quite a, a stagnant team. Is it for us uh, ignorant Victorians who don't get to follow the waffle? Have you got any any good kids running around in the waffle that might be knocking on the door? Perhaps some new blood into the team. Um, look, I mean, I don't have too much knowledge of that being in Sydney. Uh, I get most of it from from the West Coast board. I mean, on the weekend, uh, we debuted uh, Wayne Wilson mm. um, down in defence. Well, I thought I pro- probably had a very good game for a, for a debutant. Um, I'm not too sure what the numbers are around. Um, you know, Mitch Morton was... Was it Mitch Morton? Who's, what Morton do, does West you, Coast have? You've got Kale. 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 Yeah. away from Kale. Kale. variety. Um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> You know, his, you know, his waffle numbers picked up a little bit, um, but then he got injured. And that just seems to be the um, the way they go in the waffle at the moment. They play a couple of good games and uh, they get injured. Murray Newman 
was playing better after having a, an atrocious uh, pre-season, um, but was looking good, kicking a couple of goals, but he now he's injured. So, um, yeah, not really too much at the moment going on in Waffle, to my knowledge, that anyone is going to be, you know, banging down the door to get a game. Oh, you've got so. a couple other retreads on. You've got um, Jamie Bennell, who yep. came over, and I think you've got you've got Brad Dick on the list as well. Yeah, Brad Dick, he's, um, I, I think he's also injured again as well. Um, oh, he's got the shoulder uh, thing, hasn't he? Might have been, but he, he, he was, I think he's averaging a couple of goals, and he's, his numbers aren't great, but I mean, I think if you, you chuck him into a game and you chuck him in the forward pocket, it, he's, he's a pretty good player for when he was at Collingwood, he, he was fairly good. Um, if he's fit, I'd be more than willing to give him a go. I wanted to ask, the Chris Judd trade, how many years has it been since the Judd trade? So, what what do you this far down the track? How do you guys feel about the trade? Is it do you feel like one of you is one and one of you hasn't, or does it feel like it's a, a good deal for both? Good deal for both. I'd, yeah, I think it's a great deal for both. I'd, uh, yeah, I'd call it line ball. That's a draw, I reckon. I think Eagles people might think that they could have won another flag with him, but he wanted to come home, and I mean they got a good forward out of it. We got someone that helped turn our midfield around. Um, there's yeah. no question about his influence at Carlton. Um, but we, we he's got an, an ambassador, a tireless ambassador for environmental issues, and I salute his work there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to, nice to have some acknowledgement on that point. Yeah. Yeah, those, those puzzles he made are selling like hotcakes, I'm sure. All right. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to very quickly do the AFL news before we talk about Fremantle. Uh, good evening, this is the AFL News for Wednesday, June the 12th, 2013. AFL executives have come under fire for not appearing before a Senate investigation into sports science with Senator Sean Edwards labelling it a hospital pass. The AFL was instead represented by Malcolm Speed. Essendon great Tim Watson has accused Asada of using scare tactics through its investigation as players were confronted with the concept that substances taken could affect their ability to have children. Watson described the interviews as confronting. St Kilda forward Stephen Milne will meet with AFL Operations Manager Mark Evans this week to discuss the importance of stamping out abuse from fans. Former West Coast Eagle David Wurrapunda has decided to stand for a federal Senate seat for the National Party, aiming to be the first Indigenous Senator from WA and the first National Party Senator from WA in 35 years. Carlton's Mick Malthouse will coach his 850th game this week when he coaches the Blues against Hawthorne on Friday night. Former Carlton skipper Chris Judd will play his 250th game this weekend. Tiger Troy Chaplin and Fremantle's Ryan Crowley will both play their 150ths. Kane Corns will become Port Adelaide's record holder this weekend, passing Warren Treadray and Simon Black will pass this weekend's... Uh, oh, sorry, will this weekend pass Marcus Ashcroft uh, with his 318 game record for Brisbane. Tom Mitchell has received the Round 11 Rising Star nomination after his performance against the Crows on the weekend. Sydney Swans Premiership player Marty Matna has retired effective immediately due to ongoing issues with his hips. He played 222 games with the Crows and the Swans. And finally, Kurt Tippett will resume his AFL career this weekend playing a trial game for the Swans ahead of a possible senior call-up. <laughs> And this has been the AFL News. As promised in the second half of the program, guys, we are talking about uh, Fremantle. Uh, Fremantle who are doing rather better than West Coast this year um, and well uh, and truly time that that's happened uh, and so with us to talk about that we have Seppo this evening Seppo, welcome to the program Thank you for having me on How would you, you, got, you guys are doing pretty well this year, how would you, how have you seen the team's performance? Well I think it's um, great, we sort of picked up where we left off at the end of last year 
um, albeit bowing out in the final against Adelaide, but you could see what we're um, sort of building with Ross Lyon towards the back end of last season with all those wins straight. And to open the season with wins against West Coast and Bulldogs was a great start. And obviously I penciled in that win against Essendon. I don't know how we uh, dropped that one. But, um, yeah, where we're sitting now, seven, what, a draw and two losses is sort of where I pictured us being. And when you look at our fixture on the way home, I only see Geelong down in Geelong as the toughest game or the only one that's really going to um, be a stumbling block on our way to um, finishing in the top four. Yeah, I see you guys as uh, almost definitely going to fill in that fourth spot. I, I expect Essendon to get knocked out in the coming months. but uh, And that's that's just a personal prediction. But, uh, yeah, I, I expect you guys to finish in the top four this year. Is that is that where you think you should be? Definitely. Yeah, when you look at um, what we've had to do and get these wins out of so many on our injury list and all these tools just falling away, look, we've had, we've got 11 on our injury list at the moment, which is probably up there with most of the clubs, but two of them being seasons with Kepler Bradley and John Griffin going down with ACLs. It's not like they're guys that are coming back and we've had you know Pavlich out since round three and McFarlane taken out during that game and missing against the Hawks, and they were obviously games that we... Um, dropped so once we get our full fit and available team back on the park we're going to be in a, a very good position and obviously they're being a bit cautious with how they're bringing back these injured guys we're in no rush because we're winning at the moment so it's just great that we can um there's no rush to bring back Pavlich and Sandlands and they're having minor hiccups in their rehab but and it's going to set ourselves up well for the uh, run home excellent guys over to you uh, Seppo, you mentioned Ross Lyon coming over and the impact he's had, and you also touched on your depth. Now, there were some serious questions over how Ross Lyon left the St Kilda list um, after he's uh, attacked the premiership there. Uh, what do you see Ross Lyon uh, doing to future-proof this list beyond just the upcoming premiership tilt? Well, it's funny, reading a lot of the uh, Ross Lyon threads on our board and on the main board, it's interesting to see really what the underlying issue was about the um, development. And and I think Ross Lyon's jumped onto a great list management model with um, what Chris Bond has actually got Freo with, that we've we've tested our depth over through you know injuries or just the way we're rotating our younger kids. But we've drafted some really good young kids and the way that they're coming in and playing is is good and it's healthy and um, you know that some of these kids coming through now first and second year players is showing that they're they're quality players and not guys that you just go oh why why do we draft this crab and who we got to get rid of you know at the end of the year we're going to look at our list and going it's it's fantastic a lot of them being given opportunity um, we've got guys still yet to come back um, like Morabito that you can almost call it a a debutante or a draftee when he gets back onto the list because he's been out so long. But um, no, it's just really good to see um, a lot of guys pushing for a, a spot that we as fans want into the um, senior side, unlike uh, West Coast, who seem to be struggling to draw on quality from the the lower league. You mentioned Morabito there, Seppo, and it was going to be my question. Is he going to come back? Um, it's been, what, three knee recos now? Uh, and he's got that sort of that body shape. He's that really big, heavy kind of midfielder. And I absolutely loved him and I loved watching him play and I thought he brought something amazing to you guys. Um, it, will he ever come back with that same explosive burst and pace and size that he had? I think he will. Like he's, if Looking at all the uh, training videos, I, I do get to see. Obviously, I can't uh-huh. see the training myself, but um, he's still got that frame and he's looking a bit lean. He's lost a, a lot of weight and obviously he spent a lot of time in the... Jim, but he is a bulk of a unit above his shoulders and um, he, he just looks really good on the track and I think he'll probably, if he does come back into the side, obviously be slowly eased in towards the back end of the season. Um, he's been on our injury list as, you know, the tentative three to four weeks and it's been the same for a couple of weeks, but we've just had our last injury update and now they've got a definitive, um, what do they call it, end stage of his rehab. So... All he's got to do is basically get through these, tick the last box, and we could see him sort of as early as round 18 or 19. And our last four games are against GWS, Melbourne, Port, and St Kilda. So it could be quite easily, Jeez. you know, bring him in for some, you know, nice bruise free, bruise free footy as a sub in one of those games, play him on the half forward line where he's used to it. And um, yeah, if, if we're going to see him, that's where it's going to be. Excellent. 
you, uh, Fremantle has one of the sweetest draws coming home <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. If you guys don't make top four, I have no idea what's wrong with you. One of the things I think inter- uh, non-Victorian teams sweat on more than anything is their road form, and, and your road form has been impeccable. I'm really impressed with the win in Adelaide. Is, is this an attitude thing? Is this just being better organised? Is it just I think a, it's a, a bit more of... mature list? or? I think it's the organisation as well because when I've spoken to the guys, like I've, um, I've I've noticed myself the the routine these players are doing when they're coming over here and and the way they're they're travelling and um, the timing of everything. Ross seems to be a, a well routine person, and the players are obviously getting into the habit of that and preparing and just you know being mentally prepared for away games as as it is a home game. So you can sort of see what changes he's made. Just from those small things outside the actual um, the game, which is I don't I don't think you can discount Ross Lyon in this at all. Um, I, I watched you guys take us to pieces in the towards the end of last year, and it was like watching a Ross Lyon side, a St Kilda side that used to take North to pieces at will. It was exactly the same, and all due to respect to the Fremantle players, that was Ross Lyon that won you that game. So I think your really improved ability to win in Melbourne now, especially at Eddie had all the credit to Ross Lyon there. He just, he has a, a supernatural bond with that ground. And he's a great game day coach as well. He just knows oh, what he's doing. Beautiful, and, yeah. And the way he moves players around, like the whole Dorset and the Ruck thing we had a couple of weeks ago, and then even just against Adelaide, dropping five behind the ball in that last quarter to just mop out everything was just... It's so good to see, and it's just coaching moves that some of us talk about. Think you'd never think of these type of things, and all of a sudden they pop up, and it's it's won us a couple of games, and you know got us that draw against Sydney, where I, for as a fan, I was watching that game, going, "All right, now nah, Sydney have got us here," but the the way they just shifted a couple of things around and made it work for us, we nearly pinched the win. Uh, Sapo, you've got um, three key players in McFarlane, Pavlidge, and Sanderland, Snailstone to get really get on. Um, obviously, Pavlidge and McFarlane are obviously very much the key bookends of the side. Who's coming up through the ranks to replace them? Um, my biggest worry about all those three senior guys would probably have to be Pav at the moment because we've got great stocks of defenders on our list and with the likes of Silvani and Tanner Smith, who um, was our one of our draftees last year, look really good. Um, and even Folks, who's been on our list but might be cut at the end of the year. Um, quite happy with our back end, but Sandlands has obviously got natural replacements with Clark, Griffin, Hanif, and even a young Moller who was our um, Sydney um, Academy person we rookied. So we've got a bit of ruck stocks, but Pavlich, we've just got no answer. We're almost playing now with a makeshift forward line. So that's my biggest worry. But the fact that we've been playing without Pav and getting these wins means it's sort of okay at the moment, but we do need a long-term fix. And I don't know if we're going to require someone at the end of the season through trade or free agency. There's not many, you know, Pav replacements just. Well, there's one big name, I think. There's one big name that um, obviously pops up and that's Lance Franklin. Let's talk about another. Let's not also talk about Aaron Black either. Yeah, I like Black. I'd rather poach Black than uh, Buddy, based on um, you know what the demands would be for you know salary type of thing. But I don't know. I just I'd, I'd prefer Aaron. What Black we'd and ask you wouldn't want to pay. <laughs> Obviously, Harry Taylor was mentioned quite a bit on our board as a, a swingman to add to both ends. But it sounds like he's close to signing. But I don't know if that was just rumor or them trying to hush all the talks that was gaining momentum about him coming to WA. But um, I'd love Harry Taylor over all. All, all jokes aside, Seppo, how much cap space would the Dockers actually have? I mean, that's have you got anybody going into um, veteran status or are you actually dropping any big contracts off? Well, we, we do have... I think we were probably the biggest cap space available. Oh, I saw some chart floating around at the end of last year. Obviously, you've got to be within that 95%, but I think Freo had the biggest chunk of available salary space available to mm. basically go around, and that's why they could throw such big money at... Buddy, if he wants to come across, or do you want do you want Robbie Warnock Warnock back? <laughs> you, you can, you can. Oh, it's just That's asking, just putting it out. Shutters. <laughs> he keeps chucking a mask bar. Hey, Seppo, listen, you guys haven't played on the MCG this year, as far as I can recall. No, um, you, you don't get too many games on the MCG, obviously, and that's where that's where the big ones played. 
Uh, you've got a couple games later in the year. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, you look. You know, the Ross Lyon game plan is unmistakable. You, uh, you're 13th for uh, points for, first for points against. Um, you, you tend to strangle sides. Um, I, I don't. I don't find it as unsightly as it was at St Kilda. I think you know, Frio has some different players that make it make that sort of um, that sort of game a, a bit more attractive. But um, are, are you at, at all concerned um, about how that game plan will hold up uh, on the vast expanses of uh, the width of the MCG? Well, I suppose we've got Subiaco as um, a really long, wide ground. Um, that we've been playing. I don't know what the size specs are, how that lines up to the MCG. I think it's a lot thinner, isn't it, Subi? Subi's longer than I think the MCG, but a bit narrower. So obviously yeah. there's a bit more space at the MCG, but um, we've obviously had some wins there last year. We um, we had three games there, and I think we only lost to Collingwood only from a, a bad start in the first quarter. So I um, oh know we can play there and win. Obviously, we beat Geelong in the final, so and that was good conditions, and we had great players available against a good side. So I'm not worried about that now. Before I was, but the fact that I've seen our guys play against Geelong there last year is, um, yeah, settled any doubts from my point of view. And even still, I, I went last year and I saw the Richmond Fremantle game at the MCG, and Fremantle handled the ground perfectly. And as they uh, showed against Geelong in the finals, I don't think the MCG is going to be an issue for them. And we still got players to make use of that space. We've, you know, we've added Daniel Pierce to our side this year. We haven't really seen him. He's still learning the game plan. I've um, showing a bit of faith. He hasn't been that crash hot in the first ten weeks, but I reckon it's just because he's learning to adjust from coming across from Port to um, playing under Ross Lyon. It took our players playing group last year the full first half of the year to really get what was going on. So I expect Daniel Pierce to have a crack a second half of the year. And once we've got him and Hilly going, we'll. Um, we'll be able to tear up those open spaces and play some nice attacking footy. And that's what we're lacking at the moment. Now, this links into a, a thread on the main board right now, Sapo. but if you're talking about a, recruiting a forward, there's a young man by the name of Jack Watts who uh, was tenuously linked with Fremantle. Now, Daniel Pierce is probably a good segue to this because he's almost a reclamation project for, Fre- uh, for Fremantle in that he was very much a front-runner at Port Adelaide, dare I use the phrase, downhill skier, could Fremantle rehabilitate Jack Watts? And would you want them to? No. I think, when I think about what Daniel Pierce was in the term, you know, downhill skier, is completely different to the problems that we'll have if we try and bring across Jack Watts. Because I think his issues are more mental. And I just think back to what we had with Jack Anthony that, even Ross Lyon couldn't fix. I think it was it's all in his head, and the damage has been done to Jack Watts, and it's going to take a, a psychologist, not a coach, to make him become a better player. It's just something that you go, yeah, he's got the body, but the way I watch him play and, and his his body language, it just doesn't look something that um, you could fix by you know bring him into a good side. It will just yeah, it's not something I want to bring to Fremantle. It's the nature versus nurture argument in some respects because Melbourne are, are basically being accused of drafting great kids and not being able to develop them, whereas Fremantle, uh, Ross Lyon has a... Zach Dawson's another example. I mean, I, I wouldn't have given two cents for him when he left Hawthorne. He was terrible. But Ross Lyon's had him across two clubs and turned him into a, a serviceable AFL footballer. So this clearly getting into a, a better system and, and giving you a niche and giving you a very defined role and this is what you do and this is where you run... That might be the guidance he needs rather than uh, get the ball and see what you can do with it, which seems to be Mark Neal's game plan. It's, I mean, I, I'm fairly pessimistic about Jack Watts myself. I, I do think he um, uh, lacks a certain something. But, um, yeah, it's, I'm interested to, yeah, I was interested to hear what you say about it. Well, it's quite interesting. If I threw that back on everyone else, would they all be happy with Jack Watts at their club if I... Um put that question out to all you guys because I said I'd probably take 20 other players on Melbourne's list before I took Jack Watts. Yeah, he's not, he's not on my radar from Melbourne's list. Uh, take, him he... north, take him at north, third tall in the back line, definitely. Great disposal. You what? take him. Ahead of, Intercept Marks. Marks. Hey, ahead of McMahon, someone like that. Intercept McMahon, Marks, Marks yes. Intercept, Intercept Marks. Marks. I mean, he's right up there. Yeah. Oh, we've got Gary yeah, Gibbons who are probably for. leading the comp with that. So we don't need uh, Jack Watts for Intercept Marks. We've already got our own. Yeah. And we've got Cal Hooker, where's that? 
<laughs> Mick, Mal- Mick, Mick Malthouse was a little bit of a mentor of, uh, for Jack Watts uh, last year, apparently. So And Joe Watson this year. Oh, was he? Yeah, so he seems to be getting the help and all that sort of stuff. But I, I think if I actually, I'm going to take a contrarian view here, but I think um, Jack Watts in a successful environment will yield some good results. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I, I have my doubts. I, I think I just couldn't see him getting a game of Hawthorne. I just couldn't see him getting a game. I mean, and I don't know that Al Clarkson would uh, have the patience for him, to be honest. Yeah, but I don't think question, be, would the Gold question, Coast be a good fit? I don't no, think he'd be the same no. player, though, Messenger. I, you, you, play, you play to the limits of your environment, I think, to a, a certain extent. And I think you limit your playing ability by remaining at a club that you know, shall we say, isn't all that good at professional football at the moment, to uh, borrow a phrase. And if, if if he went into a more professional environment, if he went to Sydney or he went to Hawthorne or he went to Geelong, there's there's a good chance that he would develop. It's a catch-22, though, because if you did throw him into Fremantle's 22 at the moment, there's some young gun that's missing out. And it's almost a slap in the face to them and just saying, oh, hey, look, we're playing Jack Watts ahead of you. So I'm not saying you should draft him. There's always going to yeah. be... Like, there's always going to be some. He's got to fit in to your team structure as it stands, and Fremantle's structure is pretty good, as we've just, you know, we've established that already. You don't get to sit fifth with a good chance of getting into fourth and higher if you don't have a good structure. I mean, you look at Carlton, and our structure could be a lot better, and we're nowhere near where you guys are. Um, round twelve, there's some uh, clubs with the buys and whatnot coming up. Yay! Um, you got to love these buy rounds; they really are annoying. Um, what are what are we looking forward to this weekend, guys? And uh, perhaps we'll start with Messenger this time. Oh, look, I think it's finally time. After 12 rounds, we finally have the 2012 runner-up playing Friday night football. We've had Brisbane. We've had bloody Sydney. We've had Collingwood out in for night. And we finally get Hawthorne on Friday night football. Thank goodness. ODN? Uh, well, yeah, I am, I'm looking forward to Friday night football, um, specifically playing another big game against Hawthorne. Let's face it, Carlton are, Carlton are Hawthorne's bitches. Um, there's no there's no, no escaping it. They beat up on us um, quite regularly. Um, uh, I think you noticed in our Big Footy Blues podcast that, um, that uh, every sort of second game, Carlton get close, but we never, you know, we, we never get over the line. And... Um, after after last Friday night and what I'd call as you know, stopping to a walk, um, it, it's we've really got to get out there and see the message and um, and man up because Hawthorne's midfield is tough as tough as teak, and um, there's a few players in our side that um, have to show they've got a heart. Okay, and uh, the prosecutor, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Well, I'm looking forward to having a few drinks with the um, fellow brethren on the Essendon Big Footy Board and then going along to Etihad Stadium Saturday night to see Essendon and the Gold Coast in what should be a really good game. Um, obviously, the Gold Coast are in a bit of form and even Essendon um, have a bit to be excited about. And how, that's what how, footy did the Gold Coast, how did Gold Coast go last week? I can't remember. Oh, they had a fantastic win over, who, who was it, North Melbourne? Uh, they, they, played, they, they played a really good game. Fair play to them. We played Didn't, well, I, wait, I think North Melbourne were 30 points up again, okay. weren't they? I we think they might have been too. <laughs> they, uh, they played a Gold Coast. Seppo, they played what a good are you game they rolled us. Seppo, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Oh, I'm actually looking forward. It's actually a danger game this week with um, Melbourne versus the bye. I'm really not sure how they're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a danger game for them. They could really struggle. No, actually, my uh, seriously, I'm actually looking for a bit of an upset this round. Um, I'm looking at GWS getting up over Port and even Gold Coast getting over Essendon. I just want to see those two expansion clubs, you know, take a bit of a scalp rather than just, you know, GWS to get up off that bottom of the ladder. Um, and take a port that's struggling at the moment, or even just Gold Coast the way they played. And Brisbane showed they can do it against Essendon. So I just hope that um, Gold Coast of you know we can ablet one man show, just take them on, and hopefully get some points out of those two. Pants, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Well, I think the fact that uh, North Melbourne have a bye, we won't lose big footy for a night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one positive. I'm looking. Just going through the fixture now, and I think besides Carlton Hawthorne, all the other games are pretty shit out. Um, you know, you could you could pick them all pretty easily, um, and probably 
can be some big wins for a couple of teams. But I think that Carlton Hawthorne game on Friday night, that's a proper Friday night fixture. Yeah. That'll be a good one for football. Yeah. yeah, and Jamie, what are your uh, what are you looking forward to this weekend, mate? Um, I reckon Jeremy Cameron's going to go absolutely mental against Port, so yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that because he's the best young player in the league by such a street. And I, I use the term advisedly, best young forward since Carey. Um, just amazing. I reckon he's going to have an absolute day out against Port. Before we sign off tonight, um, if you haven't already done so, please check your relative boards for their individual podcasts. Uh, the Big Footy Blues, the Big Footy Dockers, the Suns have their Suns cast. Uh, Bay 13 have their own cast um, so if you, and you can find the details on their respective boards uh, the Pies are doing their first attempt at a podcast tonight so good luck with that and uh, hopefully yesterday we'll have one up in the coming weeks but uh, if your board isn't doing one uh, don't wait for someone else to do it get it started yourself it is easy to do if you need a hand with it you can uh, PM me on the big footy board and I'll be happy to uh, help you out in any way I can and the basketball boys will be probably having one soon, I hope. So, things are moving apace, and I'm sure Chief is clapping his hands with glee. So, thank you very much, uh, Seppo. Thank and, you. And uh, Pants Kyle for coming on board. We hope that uh, we showed due respect to uh, your, your teams and that uh, you had an enjoyable experience. Thank you very much to Jamie Johnston for coming I, back. I didn't have an enjoyable experience, but I'll come back. <laughs> and, <laughs> You could have had the night off, mate. I offered you the night <laughs> off, but no, there you go. And Someone has to turn up in blue and white. Prosecutor, thank you for oh. coming back again, mate, at short notice. Always a pleasure. And uh, ODN and Messenger, as always, pleasure to have you guys on board. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I love you, Lance. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go, Trinity. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, Miss Chiefs. Uh, Vivid discussions of his uh, tour around uh, Sydney and uh, Taronga Zoo and wherever else he may have been this week. Uh, Luna Park. Luna Park. <laughs> I went to Castle Main on the weekend. It was fantastic. Really? Really? Yeah. Take the they were, were they shooting a period drama up there by any chance? Siggy yeah. Thornton up there? It was, yeah, John Waters was there too. John Waters, eh? And Lisa McCune as well. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, I'll say goodnight as well. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, we'll see you all on the forums.